Welcome to Candid Conversation number 615. Today we're in Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. These verses here put churchianity on its head. It, it, just in two verses, Paul disproves what churchianity is trying to accomplish. What they do is they put everybody under the law with this idea that, well, after, yeah, you were this really bad person before you were saved, but now that you came to the church and you accepted Jesus into your heart, well, now you're this really good person. You know, the church I grew up in, I remember, they had three-step process, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and if someone sanctified, they'd say, well, yeah, that, he was a real good person before, you know, when he was saved, but now he's sanctified, oh, yeah, he's going to be even a better person. It's all about, churchianity is all about putting people under the law and through guilt and fear, getting people to obey the law. So now you're a better person or a good person because of because you're in Christ. I know there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. But that's apart from Christ. And after you come to Christ, you're a new creature. So you're suddenly good now. In reality, though, it is. And so since you're good, then and now you're just going to obey the law. So make sure you obey the Ten Commandments. But in reality, what it is is you were never a good person before you're saved. You're not a good person after you're saved. Philippians 3.21 says, You have vile flesh. Romans 7.18 says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so, you're not changed in terms of the person you are, but when you are a new creature, that means you are taken from being in Adam to being in Christ. You're in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the new creature. Not you being any better in your vile flesh and so old things have passed away old things have become new that means that you were an Adam and you had to obey the sin nature and now you're in Christ and now you can operate by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus you can now operate by that sound doctrine and what we learned yesterday Galatians 3 24 25 the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So that there tells you that you're not under the law. Romans 6.14 says you're not under the law, but under grace. So now you're under this whole new system once you are saved. And it's not about putting guilt or fear in you, because all that's gone. Christ has forgiven you of all your trespasses. Colossians 2.14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So the power that churches have over you with their fear and guilt, putting you under the law, saying, oh yeah, now that you've come to Christ, now you're a, a so much better person, and so now you have the ability to obey the law. That's just a bunch of nonsense to get your money, to get you to keep coming back for more because if they can put you on a performance-based system because there is none good no not one then that means you will never perform perfectly so you'll never it's sort of like if you were to go to a college well you go to the college for four years and you graduate but they could get a lot more money from you if you took the college courses for life so what churches do instead of having that basically being saved is your graduation program so to speak you're not under the law you're justified by faith you're now under grace and so now you can allow grace to operate in your life but if you do that they're not going to get all that money so they come up with a performance-based system and whereby that you can never fulfill yourself so you never have full assurance of salvation and so then you have to keep coming. So it's like a college, but the college never ends. It's a college for life. 
And so you're always giving money to the church. You're always trying to perform. You're always trying to be good enough to just, oh, I just hope I can make it into heaven. People have gone to church, been a Christian all their life, on their deathbed, and they still don't have the assurance of salvation. These verses here give you the assurance of salvation. It says, Thou art no more a servant, but a son. The chapter starts in Galatians 4 verse 1 about how a child, though he is heir, differs nothing from a servant when he's a child because he's under tutors and governors. Let's say you got this estate, hundreds of millions of dollars this guy has, and you're the son of that. As a child, five, six-year-old child, you don't have any authority. You're just like a servant in that household. You can't say, oh, let's, uh, let's pay uh, $20 million to buy this uh, company. We'll make it a subsidiary of the larger company. You can't do that as a child. You're under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. But then, once you become an adult, you're mature, the time appointed of the father, the father says, oh, now you are an adult son. So now you can make decisions in the company. You know, I make you the, the CFO, let's say, and so now you make all the financial decisions, or uh, you can make decisions on what we're gonna buy and what we're gonna sell and you know, those types of things. You're given all this responsibility because you're mature enough to handle it now that you're an adult. Well, that's what happens with you spiritually speaking when you believe the gospel. Romans 5, 9 says you have now been justified by his blood. Verse 11 says you have now received the atonement. Colossians 3 says that our lives are hid with Christ in God. The moment you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, God takes you out of Adam and places you into Christ. And so because when he looks at you now, what he sees is Christ. Ephesians 1, 6 says you are accepted in the beloved. And that in that, you have been forgiven all your trespasses. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see some snotty-nosed brat, immature child. He sees you in Christ. He see, When he looks at you, he sees Christ. He sees all the wonderful things that Christ is. No sin. The abundant eternal life of Christ coming through you. And so since he sees Christ, he says, just like the, the guy with hundreds of millions of dollars, when his son is mature enough, then he says, okay, now you're, you're part of the company just like me. It's father and son here. And so you get to uh, participate in the company just like me. Uh, just like you're, you're me because you're now old enough to make those decisions. And that's what God has done with us. Christ is the Son of God. The Son of God is mature enough to receive the inheritance. That's why after he was obedient to the cross, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So the Son has received the inheritance once he was died, buried, and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. And we are placed in the Christ. Ephesians 2, 6 where it says we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places, in Christ. And so since Christ is in the position of authority, far above all things, then because we are in Christ, we are far above all things. And God looks at us and sees us as mature adults in Christ the moment we believe the gospel, which is why it says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, it's through Christ because we're placed into Christ. And the inheritance goes to Christ because he conquered death. Now, through Christ, we are an heir of God. There are, thou art no more a servant, but a son. So God looks at us, and he doesn't say, oh, you're like a weaned child, 
or you got to obey the Ten Commandments or you got to make sure you keep short accounts with God if you don't have if you have any unconfessed sin on your life then you're going to hell it's none of that stuff you've already received forgiveness of sins you've already received the atonement you already have eternal life you're already seated together with Christ in heavenly places therefore you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and you put that all together that means then you are no more a servant but a son so you're no longer under the tutors and governors of the law remember yesterday the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster why because we have been brought to Christ the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the moment we believe the gospel, we have been brought to Christ. We are placed into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And so then God sees us as full-grown, mature, adult sons and daughters of God because we are in Christ. So he says, Thou art no more a servant, but a son, which means you're not under the law, you're under grace. You don't need to obey the Ten Commandments, you don't have to pay tithes, and I know the legalist comes out and says, well, yeah, that's true, that Christ is forgiving you of your sins. You don't have to do those things, but you should want to do those things. You should want to obey the Ten Commandments. And that's true, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about what you should do. We're talking about your position, your standing. Your standing is, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. If I'm a servant in a household, and I do a lot of bad things, they're going to say, you're fired, pack your bags, get out of here. But if I'm a son, and I do a lot of bad things, same things that the servant did, I'm still in the household. The Father forgives me of my sins because I am a son. I'm not a servant, I'm a son. And I've got maturity, I've got responsibility, I'm an adult. I'm treated just like an heir. That's why it says, Thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So my standing, regardless of what I do after I'm saved, is that I have eternal life, I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, I'm seated together with Christ in heavenly places. I have received the inheritance. I'm an heir of God through Christ. That is my standing. That is who I am, regardless of what I do. Sure, I should want to obey the Ten Commandments. But because of my standing, now the motivation has changed. I go to work today. I'm a servant of my employer. I should want to do a good job, but a lot of people do a job. That's why you have bosses. The people do a good enough job to where the boss is pleased with them so they don't lose their job. There's a fear factor there. You may want to tell the boss off. You may want to curse out customers. There are a lot of things you may want to do, but you refrain yourself from doing that because you're worried you could lose your job. But if you're the owner, you still shouldn't curse out customers because it's going to hurt your business. So you sh should still, op you should still be, if you're an owner versus being a servant or an employee, the owner should still have great behavior, should still have the same behavior as the servant. It's just the motivation is different. The employee's motivation is, I'm going to do a good job so I don't lose my job. So out of fear, he does a good job to keep his job. The owner isn't afraid of losing his job because he owns the company. No one can fire him. You know, assuming it's a small company, not a board of directors and all that. Um, he can't be fired. But he still want to do a good job, not because he's afraid of being fired but because he wants the company to do well. Because he's part owner of the company. And that's how it is with Christ. Before you're saved, you're under the law, and so you try to obey the law because you're afraid of getting punished. But once you believe the gospel, now you're an heir of God. You're part owner of his company, so to speak, being an heir of God. Now you still want to do a good job, but your motivation isn't, I'm afraid that I'm going to 
be fired or lose my position. Your motivation is, I want to bring glory to God. God is the Father of glory. And He has included me in His glory plan as a part owner, as an heir of God. I can spread His glory throughout the world for all eternity by sharing His love with others. And so my motivation isn't fear anymore, it's love. So if I'm no more a servant, see, the motivation changes. So now my attitude changes. Now I'm not worried, oh, I could lose my salvation, or maybe I won't go to heaven. I gotta make sure I please the church, please the pastor, please the family, please the friends. All that fear is gone. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1 says. I don't have any fear of losing my salvation. I have peace with God. Oh, well, just because you have peace, you should want to obey. Yeah, I should want to obey. That's right. But it's not me out of fear saying, oh, I better obey, or people will think I'm not saved, or I could lose my salvation, or I don't have genuine faith. It's God has entrusted me with being an heir. I've got a tremendous responsibility in heavenly places and I'm an heir through Christ. So I should let Christ live through me so God's love is shown through my life and God gets the glory. I'm part of the glory plan. The owner of a company, when you're a part owner of a company, your incentive isn't, I'm gonna lose my job. Your incentive is bring glory to the company, bring more money, bring revenue, bring growth, You know, um, take care of problems. That's your incentive. And this is your, that's your incentive as a child of God. Once you're no more a servant but a son, once you believe the gospel, you're an heir of God through Christ. And so your incentive is, oh, I just hope I can make it. I hope I don't lose my salvation. Your incentive is God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has given me his love. And I have the responsibility now to share that love wherever I go so that others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth so the company can grow so to speak you know using the analogy there the company grows and so what that does is it sets churchianity on its head because churchianity is all worried about fear and guilt and motivating you out of you could lose your salvation you could lose your standing with God you may not go to heaven you could lose your standing with our company and the reality is that's not the case. So get rid of the fear and guilt and now you just allow Christ to live in you as an heir of God. Because ye are, and you see, that was verse 7, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son then an heir of God through Christ. Notice verse 6, notice how you serve. Remember, churchianity says you're under the law, you need to obey the Ten Commandments. Christ died for me. I'm going to live for Him. My flesh is now better. I'm a new creature. I'm a better person. And so now I'm really going to serve God. I messed up in the past, but now I'm really going to serve God. And that's your motivation. But really, in reality, when you're saved, Galatians 4, 6 says, Because ye are sons because you've already received the inheritance, because you're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son in your hearts, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's the motivation. The motivation isn't fear or guilt. The motivation is the Spirit of His Son is now in your hearts. And through that you cry, Abba, Father, or Dear Father. Churchianity does not cry, Abba, Father. Churchianity cries, Oh, I just hope I can make it. I hope I can endure until the end. I hope I have fruits that are meat for repentance. I hope I have, uh, you know, I just did good enough to keep the salvation or uh, be a good servant of God. No, it says the motivation is the spirit of His Son in our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So yeah, we should obey the Ten Commandments. Yeah, we... Now, nah, Sabbath day. I realize that some of that is for Israel. But yeah, we should obey God's word. We should obey the commandments given to us by our Apostle Paul in Romans through Philemon. But the motivation isn't so I can endure unto the end so that everybody knows that I had true saving faith so that um, 
you know, I get a position in the church or whatever. That's not the motivation. The motivation is I've got the spirit of a son in my heart crying, Abba, Father. As an heir of God, as a part owner of the company, I've got the son within me crying, Dear Father. So then, yeah, I serve God, but it's not out of fear. It's out of love. The father loves the son. The son loves the father. The son says, Dear Father, that shows love. I and my father are one, Jesus said. And so the Abba Father is the desire of the Son to always do what the Father would want Him to do. And so the motivation, once we are saved, is to allow Christ to live in us. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me, Galatians 2.20. So it's not self-motivation, flesh motivation, fear motivation. It's Christ motivation, God the Son motivation, love motivation, bringing the Father glory motivation. That's the difference. And so that's what, and until you recognize you're standing with Christ, standing with God in Christ, you will never understand that, which is why churchianity won't teach Romans 6, that we have been baptized into Christ. So we are participating in his death, burial, and resurrection. That we are crucified with Christ. They don't, when, they don't want to recognize that because if they recognize that, then it's not about me, it's about Christ. And they can't motivate people with fear. But when we recognize I'm dead to sin and alive unto Christ, ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When you recognize you're baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, now it's all about Christ living in me, living by the faith of the Son of God, not living by the fear of the punishment from God or from the church or from the bad looks I'll get from people because I said a curse word. It's not about fear, it's about love. It's about God's love coming through my life. I've been given the spirit of a son whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so I should be motivated out of love. So yeah, I should read my Bible. I should obey what Paul's epistles say, but it's not out of fear, it's Christ living in me. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. John 13, 34 and 35, he says that. And so if I have God's love coming through me, then others will, if who are searching for the answer, will ask me and they'll get the gospel from me and then they'll be saved or others who are struggling in their Christian walk I can give them sound doctrine for their situation they can come into the knowledge of the truth and Christ can live in them not fear motivation but the motivation of love that is what grace is all about and that's who we are in Christ don't let anyone rob you and put you under a yoke of bondage to the law today when you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Let the love of God come through your life to others. Thanks for watching.